Hello, Year 10 students, and welcome to page 211 to 234, maybe, um, of the Lieutenant. Um, have your highlighters, your pens ready, and let's get annotating. All right, so um, we are beginning, and this section, my summary is um, like the assault of. Tugia. I have no idea how to pronounce the name, by the way, but let's let's just say it's there, Tugia. Um, so um, Rook has just come out of that meeting with Silk, where Silk kind of sexualizes and misinterprets all the interactions in his journal in Rook's journals that he reads, um, and he's left. Rook is left feeling kind of uncomfortable and um, awkward, I guess. Um, and he, after this, something in Rook was still reverberating a disturbance in the air, a tremor in his sense of himself. And suddenly, Kamara, Kamara, uh, Tagaran comes in and she's got Tugia and Warrigan um, and they're breathless and crying and they come pouring into his hut, his observatory, um, and Tagaran is in disarray as he has never seen her, his fa her face wet with tears. Um, and she's like breathing heavily, air is heaving raggedly in and out. She's trembling like a horse after a gallop, and he sees this brilliant blood red on her arm and her side. Um, and she's speaking so fast, he can't understand what she says. Um, he brings the girls in and gets a blanket for them to sit on, and um, he gives them each his meager supper, a little piece, even though it's really he's only small himself, but he's leaving himself a mouthful. And here Tugia is sobbing and she couldn't, she wouldn't taste the water or the biscuits. And she's sitting with her knees up to her shoulders. So picture her crouched up almost into a ball. Um, and so... Um, then tell me what's this happened what's all this that's happened um Tugia, well they all speak um and he's saying look you got to speak more slowly and tagaran basically he says something that rook interprets here and as he's computing the meaning his heart shrinks because he's translated it as a white man beat Tugia. And this is something that he did not want to hear. It's funny to hear that because, of course, nobody ever wants to hear that. And, and But part of the reason that Rook doesn't want to hear it is because he, because of the British Imperial Machine, he's so powerless to actually do anything about it too. So even it's almost like he'd rather not know just in the same way remember when the prisoner was um caught he said oh i wished that he hadn't been caught not that he hadn't have done it but oh i wished that he hadn't have been caught in it anyway tagaran acts this out an angry face a hand rising and falling and um some outraged marine or convict um he, he um rook thinks it's brugden for a while um but uh, later we find out it's actually not, but um, then Tar Tagaran um, sort of acts out how it hurts. Um, it opens a long cut on her arm. It hurt her finger and there's a stick-shaped wheel on um, Tugia's back. So she, she was being beaten with a stick basically. And her face is full of pain and outrage. And even here, look at this, she turned her face up to him, full of pain and outrage, kind of inviting Rook to share that outrage also. And he cradles her hand, looks at it. It's not broken, but it was swollen. Um, and... Um, Tugia kind of flinches and why are you afraid? Basically, she's afraid of the men. Um, and she points at the cut 
It's very painful. Um, so Rook can't help thinking of the other back he'd seen so recently, which is the prisoner's back and the whipping. Had Tagaran seen it? He thought not, but something about her manner told him that she had heard about it and he could not meet her eye. Shame. Um, she tells the story again with even more dramatic gestures. Her voice was shrill with outrage and then she watched him. Rook knew what she wanted. She wanted him to ask questions. Who did this to you? Why? Where is he now? She wanted him to join her in indignation, to put on his jacket and stride away to the settlement to deal with the white man who had beaten them. Basically, she is expecting, inviting, wanting him to be angry about this injustice. But there was a heavy place inside him where the event was sitting undigested like a piece of bad food. And he says, I'm very angry. But he knew he did not sound angry. And they ask, with us? Well, not with you. It's such a wrong idea that he looked in surprise. Um, and she says, Camera, will you speak? He had never thought that he might wish to understand less. And that sense of he's unable to do anything and so he wants to, like he, he, um, he wishes he didn't know and didn't understand. Um, and then his reflection here is this was not a language lesson. This was a real conversation. For the first time, he and Tagaran were on the same side of the mirror of language. They were just speaking to each other. Understanding went in both directions. Once two people shared a language, they could no longer use it to hide. And Rook can't hide from this injustice. And so who um, will you speak? Well, to whom? To the person belonging to the Charlotte, so one of the ships. So it wasn't Brugden, but one of the sailors from the HMAS Charlotte. And he pictures himself rowing out to the Charlotte, asking to see the captain and saying something like, Sir, some man from your ship has beaten three native girls. I wish to discover and punish him. The captain would look at him, really, Lieutenant, native girls, eh? And, like, he can imagine this scene and, um, but he can't imagine himself in it. Um, and... Basically, he so now he then goes and eats the rest of the gives the girls the rest of the biscuit. Um, and Rook is clearly conflicted, but the girls had not missed a single thing. Not that there was a morsel of biscuit left for himself, but they hadn't also missed the fact that camera friend was not going to stand up for them and he tried like to like put on a pantomime of giving like breaking up um and they were Warrigan and Tagia were amused by his play acting but Tagaran and waiting for Tagaran to forgive him um as he gives that last morsel at biscuit that he kept for himself um Uh, so all three girls were hit or beaten. I thought it was just Tagia, but um, Tagaran's finger is sore. One of the back is sore. I don't know if we could piece it together. Basically, the girls were beaten. Um, and um, so Tagaran there becomes, plays the hostess, shows them how to um light a fire with the flint make a spark how to sharpen the hatchet how um, the compass shows like show and tell all of the things that she'd learnt um and there were a few enough objects in the hut for her to be aware of her avoiding the one in the corner behind the door his musket so it's not like he had a full, full hut. He only had a couple of things and she was showing all of the things except for the musket. Um, but now he was aware of it there and of Tagaran ignoring it. Um, and so Tagia says something and they then leave. 
and the bottom here when he went into the hut he could no longer avoid this glum awareness of failure what Tagaran had wanted was impossible he tried it in his mind again going out to the charlotte knocking on the door of the captain's cabin the man looking at him native girls you say impossible he thought that Tagaran knew all along that it was a test he would fail and that she had forgiven him it only confirmed something that she understood already in this as in so many things she was ahead of him so he, she was more courageous she was stronger she was uh, more righteous perhaps like the innocence of a child but also the fact that the Gadigal um, morals do seem to be far superior the horror that um, Warrigan felt with watching the whipping of the prisoner for example as an evident of this they all knew what he had turned his face away from. It's like he's ignored. Um, you know that saying, evil prospers when good men do nothing? It's kind of like something that Kate Grenville seems to be um, exposing here, with not necessarily directly but indirectly, that idea that he, he's actually ignoring because he feels that there's nothing he can do. Um, the injustices that uh, the British Empire inflict on the natives. So like it or not, he was Berowalgal. He wore the red coat. That red coat is a symbol of the British. He carried the musket when he was told to. He stood by while a man was flogged. He would not confront a white man who had beaten his friends. He'd be pretending that it was not so. A world existed here in his hut, a world he shared with Tagaran and the others. So he was almost like trying to be, what's the word, blissfully ignorant, hoping that his um, responsibilities to the British Empire didn't exist. And he it has this analogy, like this world in the hut with the natives was on another orbit altogether from the one he shared with his own kind. But a man could not travel along two different paths. Tagaran knew it, now he knew it too. And the gloom that had fallen over his day was a fact that he now, until now denied, that the pleasure he found with Tagaran cast a shadow. He had been brushed by its wing this afternoon just to touch. It would return. What he shared with Tagaran was the greatest delight he had ever known. But bound up with the delight, inseparable from it, was a universe of impossibility yeah. so that conflict of conscience is um and, and that's one of the things that um grenville is really concerned about right from the the, the first when um, Rook begins to notice the failings in the system of justice of the British Empire with the hanging of the mutineer and the, the consequences of disobeying an order and then the many things that he kind of feels uncomfortable about, well, about from gardeners' um, orders to capture uh, the two natives, Warangun and Boomba, um to the prisoner being flogged and, and now to this point where the girls have been um, beaten. Um, and you can see the way Grenville is building that tension and building the crisis of conscience um, and the, you know, that those two parts of Rook, the part that, that is full of fear to what the consequences of disobedience and the consequences of perhaps standing up for justice and doing what he knows is morally right, but then what might happen as a result of that. Um, anyway, we're going to continue. And so um, from here, um, uh, Rook thinks about, so we come on, Rook thinks about destroying these notebooks um, because he kind of has this desire to protect his private thoughts and this special experience of his relationships with um, Tagaran in particular, um, and, but he obviously doesn't um, because we know it's William Dawes's notebooks that are eventually found that become the reason why Kate Grenville wrote this book. Anyway, um, now Tagaran comes in and 
she's like she comes in with a mission so she goes into the hut and she um goes straight to the corner and goes to the musket she removes the handkerchief that's draped over the end and she picks it up and he puts a hand up to stop her but she's already got it into her shoulder and her finger was against the trigger and she's pretending that she knew how to squint along its length so like she's basically trying to work out how to um, fire this musket and where had she seen it done and why she waited till now to try this thing and the memory of that first day on the beach came into his mind then Wayne, surgeon waymark actually demonstrated the power of the white man's weapon and himself laughing at that surgeon's blunt description of what a musket ball might do to a man rook hadn't be been, hadn't actually been amused and now he wonders what had possessed him to laugh and of course we know then it was that idea of um peer pressure and discomfort and you know but now he knows the natives he's actually ashamed by that instinct perhaps um, and news of that display would have traveled from tribe to tribe and Tagaran's also heard of it um, and so she picks it up again and she sticks her fingers in the end of the barrel she's asking him what makes the shot come out um, and the governor had given orders that the marines never let the natives see it was necessary to put anything into the gun yeah, so they have to put in the shot and the gunpowder, uh, but they must think it is the thing itself that is its effect is immediate and simple as that of their own lances. For the safety of us all, do not let them see the loading of it. Yeah. So Rook shook his head, held up his thumb and asked what it was called. She was not to be distracted, so he's kind of mimicking that it's a language lesson and she's not put off um, her insistence today seems to be different from her usual curiosity when she might want to know how the lid came off the inkwell or what the buckle on a shoe was for or did it only seem different because of that new shadow over things um, one thing i'd certainly noticed this uh, the fact that the, the governor's given these orders um, this unfair power imbalance due to the superior technology the technological advantage that the british have um and that's represented by the juxtaposition or that um image the symbolism of the shield that's split in half the broken shield um and the musket and the cannons as well next to these spears for example um and so finally because he found it so hard to refuse her, he thought to go halfway. So he actually disobeys an order here. Against both his orders and his own dragging reluctance, he got down the bag of shot and emptied a ball out into his palm. She snatched it up, felt it, weighed it, and tried it with her teeth before giving it back. Rook loaded it into the muzzle and wadded it down. He watched her face, intent on the movement of the ramrod in and out. He could see that she had forgotten that she was Kamara. For the moment, she was nothing more than a conduit for the knowledge she wanted. So it's interesting that conduit being used for that knowledge that she needs for her people. Um, that's, there's a foreshadowing of the betrayal that is coming. Um, and the fact that in many ways they're actually both using one another for knowledge um rook is trying to get knowledge of the language and here tagaran is trying to get knowledge of weaponry to defend themselves so his hands knew the movement of this ritual so well he could have loaded the gun with his eyes clothes so they've been taught how to do this and and he hoped this palava this demonstration of loading and wadding the shop would be enough but tagaran was not feel full that uh, fooled Okay, so she knew that there was more. She knew that there was like, um, like it wasn't complete. And so then he opened the bag and shook out the little powder into his palm. He put the pinch of powder on the pan, but did not do the essential thing. Yeah? There was no powder behind the shot to spit it out along the muzzle. At least in the letter of the law, he was still on the right side of obedience. 
So he showed both the elements, but he didn't show the complete working of the musket. And it's really interesting. You could debate in your classes, for example, what, like, what is the right thing to do here? Um, she followed him outside and, and she has at least some of the knowledge, 90% of the knowledge, how much, um, and Tagaran um, watches as he pretended to aim, pulled his finger against the trigger, and then the flint fell against the steel. Yet there's this beautiful explanation of he, the intricate workings of the musket that's earlier in the novel. It's kind of alluded to here as well. And the spark falls into the gunpowder in the pan, and she jumps back at this um, bright flash and screams, but she's delighted by it. And his face is stiff. There, I've shown you everything. Does that make you content? But she had not been taken in. She knew he had made noise and light, but that the shot was still in the barrel. Just for this day, he could have wished her stupid. Okay. She then gestures and shows him what she wants to see the lead ball hurtle itself out of the muzzle, but he would not. The noise and the flash were part of the allure of the machine, like fireworks or a pit person getting a note out of a tuba. But to shoot a piece of metal out of it could penetrate a shield or a human body. And what it says was, I can kill you. He did not want her to learn that language, certainly not from him. It's the language of violence. It's interesting here because you want to think about what's Rook's motivation here. Is he not wanting to teach her the full mechanics of how the gun works? because he wants to save her life or protect her from violence? Or is he actually trying to still stay on the side of obedience to the British Empire? Like, you can debate that too. It's not fully unpacked here. But he's saying he doesn't want her to learn that language. But perhaps he also has partly a motivation that he, doesn't all, he also doesn't want to disobey. Anyway, she pouts, cajoles and wheedles and she calls him names and begs, pleads, and he's saying, no, no, don't ask of me. And in the end, he snatches the musket away from her, puts it out of her reach and takes hold of her wrist to stop her from taking it again. Come, girl, he cried at last. Do not insist. I have said no. He could hear the anger in his voice. She heard it too. Um, and so suddenly there's no game. We know that he had never thought to use his strength against her or to speak to her in anger. But it's come to this. He watched her face tighten against him, half hidden by her hair her chin obstinate. Something had been bent out of shape by his anger as surely as it would have been by shooting. So it's like something's been broken in their relationship through this. And he says, tomorrow, will you come tomorrow? And she speaks but refuses to look at him and says, Kamara, goodbye. He feels this word like a knife. And at that rejection, the like the breaking of their relationship, he still tries to um, hold on to it and says, tomorrow I'll be here, tomorrow, but she's gone. And he watches her go, waiting for her to turn around. He would wait for her to come back. He would run to the track to join her. But she did not turn. It's interesting, you might want to think about what, has she been sent here to find it out or has she come on her own to discover? Is it she using initiative to say, I can get this information? Um, but she's desperate to find out how this gun works. Um, and I think I might stop there. Uh, so we'll go from 226 in our next video.